I'm very interested in the circumstances in which the Pleistocene megafauna are found. I'm, I'm fascinated by all of these great nonlinear events within the stratigraphic history of life on Earth. Um, and that includes, you know, the mass extinction events. But I'm especially interested in the most recent one, um, which was the terminal Pleistocene megafaunal extinction that occurred around 12 to 13,000 years ago. Now, depending on whose studies you look at, it could be a thing that's drawn out over three or four or 5,000 years, or it could be something that's very closer to instantaneous. I think that the model that makes the most sense to me is that you might have had a couple of pulses, episodes of uh, mass mortality, but you had survivors. The problem is, is that when we begin to understand how drastically the environment of planet Earth changed in that transition from Pleistocene to Holocene, whether it took 2,000 years or 5,000 years, is almost irrelevant because the, the extent of the changes that we're talking about here and the geological time spans that we're talking about are, ins, are insignificant, but the changes are very significant. And one of the things that involved, of course, was complete alteration of existing biomes, complete rearrangement of existing ecosystems. And so there may have been what we may be needing to look at is, I'll use the term bimodal, a bimodal event where you had slower extinction events, but superimposed upon that a couple of very extreme pulses of mortality. And I think that is going to be the more uh, realistic scenario. One end is a very, to me, maybe oversimplified that, boom, they're all gone in an instant, right? Some of the critics of the impact hypothesis for um, as, as, a, as a factor in the mass extinction are invoking what to me is an oversimplified scenario, a kind of a straw man scenario and saying, well, we don't see the evidence that they all disappeared in, in one day or one week. Therefore, it was not impact related, right? But I think that's oversimplified and unrealistic because I think what we're seeing here is a series of episodes whose cumulative effect was this massive alteration of the planetary ecosystem. Within that sequence of events, you had several pulses of mass mortality, and then you had more protracted episodes of mortality because of the fact that you had surviving species that were either varying degrees of successfully adapting to these dramatically altered ecologies. The ones that managed to adapt Basically, the, the evidence that they adapted was that they proliferated and they're, they're still extant rather than extinct, whereas a lot of species went extinct. And, and, you know, these are the ones we've been talking about the last couple of episodes here. We've been looking at the idea of the, the mammoths and the mastodons and the ground sloths and, and this amazing fauna, the, the, the American Pleistocene lion that was the size of a horse, the giant camels, the, the dire wolves, the list goes on and on and on. It seems to be an effort that if we're going to say, well, they didn't all go extinct at precisely the same time, therefore, it couldn't have been any kind of an impact event. See, that's kind of what it, the, the, how, where the, the, the criticism kind of plays out to, to that level, right? Whereas I go so far as to speculate, and this is, of course, speculation, that we are looking at a multiple a multiple episode of event that maybe took a total of about 3,000 years. And we brought up the idea of the meltwater pulses. Earliest meltwater pulse is now dated at 14,600 years ago. I think there might be reason to question that dating, but for now I'm, I, I'm going to accept it, right? Then we have the younger driest boundary at 12,000, I forget the exact number now, but between 12,008 and 12,900 years ago. And then we have Meltwater Pulse 1B, which is dated at 11,600 years ago, which is also the date that is now given for the, uh, the, the, the inception of the Holocene, the modern epoch that, that we now find ourselves in. So I find it interesting that there is this correlation between these things. And I'm of the, the matter that we might be looking at, in a sense, kind of a perfect storm of things. In a more modern uh, context, if we look at, um, say, the eruption of Tambora back in 1815, 
right, that, that led to the subsequent year without a summer in 1816, there were two things that sort of mutually reinforced each other. One was the volcano itself and the, the massive emissions of, of sulfate aerosols and, and dust and ash into the global atmosphere that acted as a canopy uh, preventing um, solar, the same, the, the typical amount of solar radiation to penetrate, right? But at the same time, we're in this maunder minimum, we're in this, this phase of, of lowered solar activity. So when you had the, 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 the lowered solar activity coupled with um, the volcanic eruptions, well, then, of course, it, it can be more extreme. And as, as we commented before, you know, historians have, who've looked at that episode and, and the, the famines that were generated during that, that summer of 1816, because there, were, there were, were repeated crop failures. Uh, because, in fact, there were three, like in, in northern United States, there were three frosts over the summer. There would be a frost that would kill off the, 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 the young crops, then they would replant, and then another frost would come along and kill off the plants again. So you had a lot of mass starvation. It's been called the last great subsistence crisis of Western civilization. And, and I think we're seeing the tandem effects of the cumulative effects of volcanoes and solar. And I think that we could be looking at events, and I think we're also going to be finding out as we go forward with this that many of these kinds of events are interlinked. I mean, we'll talk about this, but there is some very interesting evidence out there which suggests that impact type events can induce volcanism, right? So if that's the case, if it's the case, and if that's, that's an if, I'm not proclaiming it as, as settled science because it's not, but if it is the case, and there is evidence that seems to suggest a correlation right? A correlation between um, enhanced impact activity and enhanced volcanic activity. And David Alton and a number of other geologists have actually published on this. And, and, and you know, I think Michael Rampino and several others, I could probably pull up their references. Um, but the idea is that perhaps these great impacts or impact events exogenically can trigger uh, a, um, an endogenic response. And I think that's be a very interesting potential uh, line of study and research for the next couple of decades is this relationship between what's going on out there and what's going on down below us. And it could turn out also that the sun is playing a role, that if the sun's um, activity changes, there could be a, an endogenic response in the earth. And there's some interesting research now that is now that is showing and suggesting that the entire solar system is essentially acting as a unitary system. And it's also being modulated by forces from outside the solar system that could be um, literally a galactic level. And this is some of the where I'd like to take some of this discussion as, as we proceed through these podcasts. But for tonight, we'll continue up with this idea of, of looking at this most recent event, because obviously the most recent event events within the history of these kinds of catastrophic things is going to have the most uh, evidence preserved that we can study directly and learn from. Um, obviously, like when we go, <clears throat> when you go back in time, we can talk about the great five mass extinctions in Earth history. And the most recent of the great five, of course, was the Cretaceous tertiary of uh, roughly 66 million years ago that saw the end of the dinosaurs. Well, when we go back from there, we go back from the, the Cretaceous tertiary and we get to the Triassic-Jurassic extinction. We go back from there and we get to the Permian-Triassic. So the Triassic is actually bookended by these two incredibly intense events. Um, mass extinct, two of the great mass extinctions in the history of, of planet Earth. The Permian-Triassic uh, that, that ended the, the, the um, permian times into the Triassic and then the catastrophe that ended the Triassic. When you go back from there, we find that in the late Devonian, there was a series of, of, of catastrophic episodes. They weren't as intense as the, as the Permian Triassic or as intense as the Cretaceous tertiary, right? Of all of those mass extinctions, the Cretaceous tertiary is, is the most settled science as to cause. And, and the agreement is pretty much that it was triggered by this at least one massive impact that created the Cheekshalub crater, which is now 
buried under the Yucatan Peninsula. But there's also evidence that they're clustered around there were a number of other impacts, and some of them pretty sizable. Indian geologists have looked uh, and found evidence of a crater on, uh, they refer to as Shiva, on the floor of the Indian Ocean that looks to be in a pretty significant crater. And so a lot of the critics initially to the impact hypothesis for the extinction of the dinosaurs said, well, we can see that some species of dinosaurs that were already stressed or some species had already gone extinct, right? So therefore, there was no catastrophe. I don't read it that way. I read it that, yeah, what we're actually seeing now is that we could be looking at a juxtaposition of multiple catastrophes playing out over time, which brings us to a model that I think we need to be looking at, which is the idea that, that impacts can be randomly spread through time, but they can also be clustered. And that's a very important idea, I think, that, that there could be bombardment episodes where the um, probabilities of Earth being impacted increase maybe by several orders of magnitude. And that, again, is something we're going to explore as we move forward through these, through these discussions and through these podcasts. So in the Devonian, the late Devonian, what we see is that the, there was no episode of mass mortality to the same degree as we find in the Permian-Triassic or we find in the um, uh, Triassic-Jurassic or like we find in the Cretaceous tertiary. But what we see is it's actually spread out more and there seems to have been multiple episodes of, of mass death that then ended with, um, you know, a major loss of uh, extant species that, that had endured throughout the Devonian. Go back beyond that. I think we get to the oldest of the great five, the, the, the terminal Ordovician. Very severe. But, but one of the, the points I'm trying to make here is as we go back, each one gets a little harder to discern and, and, and tease out the kinds of proxy evidence that could really tell us what happened. But if we do look, what the, it seems that in each of the cases, and we, we, we certainly are going to talk about this in, in much greater detail. I'm actually writing up a whole series about this right now. In each of these cases, we find very convincing evidence for massive volcanism, right? The Permian-Triassic mass extinction was associated with the formation of the Siberian traps, which is this massive uh, basaltic uh, eruption, extrusive eruption, that buried about six to seven million square miles of what is now Siberia, right? Now, that much basaltic lava being spewed out is going to really pollute the atmosphere with a lot of really exotic stuff, most especially the sulfate aerosols. And it's going to trigger acidic rain on a, on a really potent level. We find also, so we find that, we find with the Triassic-Jurassic, um, extinction, there was the um, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, which was another huge volcanic outflow, right? When we get to the Cretaceous tertiary, we've got the, um, the Deccan Traps of India. An exactly, again, this massive outflow of basaltic lava and releasing into the global atmosphere all of these, all of these various uh, substances that can then linger in the atmosphere for decades. In addition to the the ash um, <clears throat> and and the particulate matter, you've also got the gases, right? So, but in addition to that, just like at the Cretaceous tertiary, we see that there appears to have been two factors involved: gigantic volcanism, gigantic impact, right? Both of those are well established. What are the relative roles of each of those? It's still being worked out. But it's clear that both of them would have had a profound effect on the stability of the planetary ecosystem. And when we go back to the Ordovician, when we come forward to the Devonian, we come forward to the uh, Triassic, to the Permian Triassic, then to the Triassic Jurassic, in every case, there is evidence, not proof, but evidence of some type of an extra, uh, extraterrestrial uh, fingerprint usually in the form of iridium, platinum, or shocked quartz. Those seem to be the three, but, but not in the levels that we find at the KT and our Cretaceous tertiary boundary, because at that level, it's pretty well concluded that there is a correlation between the extraterrestrial proxy deposition 
and the sudden and total demise of many species of late Cretaceous dinosaur. As we go back, it gets harder to make, make those subtle comparisons where we can say, well, the volcanism played this role, impacts played this role. But I think what we need to be looking at, though, again, is that impacts may be the, the ultimate trigger. The impacts are the, the shock and the force of an impact induces instabilities into the Earth's crust that's propagated through the mantle, and there could most likely, and this is not a totally fringe idea. It's out there being looked at by some major, major academic uh, people that there could be um, a, a very significant uh, response, endogenic response in the form of volcanism and seismicity. And we should definitely get into that. But so my point, I guess, in all this, two points here. One is that when we start looking at catastrophes, the problem is, is each catastrophe tends to rearrange the planet so much that it obscures the evidence for the earlier catastrophes, right? That's a part of it. Also, the idea that once you start looking at it, you realize that these catastrophes are a lot more prevalent than had really been assumed even a generation ago. And we also see this idea of thresholds that, that, you know, that something can happen. Earth had a cosmic encounter in June 30th, 1908. Didn't cause a mass extinction, right? Uh, didn't, didn't decimate half of, the he half of the globe or anything like that. It was just basically a pinprick. It was a cosmic pinprick. Yet that cosmic pinprick, now from that, we can extrapolate and go, well, what would happen if we encountered a swarm of Tunguskas, Tunguska type? And, and, and that is a very plausible model. It's, been, it's one that's been developed by the British neocatastrophists for, what, 30 years anyway. You guys should probably know about this, the book by Victor Klub and William Napier that came out in 1980 called The Cosmic Serpent. And basically that idea was that the serpent, serpent was a metaphor for these cosmic visitations. And uh, that idea is they've been developing that idea ever since. Um, we got a, a great comment from Bill Napier onto the uh, on onto uh, George Howard's website uh, after that last Joe Rogan podcast, all uh, right, where we were debating. Um, so he he knows about what what we're doing. I don't know if he's a member of the Comet Research Team or not, but I think he is. But but in any ways, these guys have been doing really important and valuable work. And developing this model, really, that, that, that puts the planet that we inhabit into a much larger cosmic ecosystem. And so I think we really need to be looking in that context in order to understand these great sweeping changes that have engulfed the, this planet repeatedly.